Uh, good morning again. Uh, thanks to the previous three speakers. Uh, I think we've learned quite a lot already. Um, I thought I'd uh, put on my first slide, print about, talk about principles, which links nicely with what Mike was talking about just a moment ago. Um, so what are we doing in the OECD and what are we doing as a group now? You know, at one point, you know, we, we academics, we have the kind of luxury of we kind of sit in our ivory towers and we kind of think about the kind of great principles and pronounce on how things should work. Um, but I, you know, I don't want to speak about Mike particularly, but let's think about kind of uh, government officials who are going to the OECD. You know, what is it that they are trying to do? You know, they don't have that luxury of, that we academics do. And you know, we might think of them as, you know, they're going to the OECD to uh, discuss options with their colleagues from other countries. Uh, as, as people have said, you know, different countries have different aims and objectives. They're all heterogeneous, they're all different. They might want different things from the tax system. Um, that makes it quite difficult. There's a game between countries <laughs> trying, which is, you know, with each country trying to get what it would want. I, um, if we, if we could move on down the, down the table here, the, the OECD has to facilitate that. You know, that's a pretty difficult job as well. And business has to kind of try and uh, get involved in some way in, in many of the ways that Janine has got. So in many ways, being the academic is, is the kind of relatively easy gig here. Um, on the other hand, you know, I think it is useful to think about principles and um, I'm glad that Mike agrees. I think the problem may be that we may not agree exactly what the principles are. Um, as, he, as he pointed out. So do good principles matter? Uh, yes, and I think they matter for many of the reasons which people have already said. Um, so if we think about ad hoc reforms without principles, then they're unlikely to be stable. In a couple of years' time, people are gonna come back and say, okay, we want something different now. You know, and what, who's to say that that isn't a good idea? Um, or um, it's gonna lead to greater complexity. We could add a bit of this, we could add some pillar one, we could add some pillar two, we could think of some other pillars three and four down the future, we could have many pillars and then the world gets more and more complex. Um, and we, uh, we're just gonna have more and more unnecessary features in the tax system. Okay, so let's take it that we want some principles. Um, problem is, you know, what are they? Uh, and I'm not gonna kind of set up a single principle in a single sentence or a single paragraph even. Um, I spent most of my talk last year in the arguing against the notion that uh, we should be taxing where values created. I'm not gonna go through that again, but uh, anybody who wants to see that is there's a video on, on YouTube somewhere, I think. Um, so I'd like to, you know, my principles are not like quite as crystal clear as that, or quite as simple as that. Um, and again, I'm referring to the, the international, our international tax group, where we started to say, well, what criteria do we, would we use to evaluate a particular tax system? Uh, and we came up with these five, which I don't think are kind of particularly controversial. There's economic efficiency. So economists get exercised about economic efficiency. I think we sometimes we have a hard time trying to persuade everybody else that economic efficiency is important. But broadly, you know, we think there are real social costs of, associated with taxes distorting behavior. Uh, and we can try and measure those costs. And sometimes we get measures which are really quite high. You know, it's hard to see them in the real world. It's, you know, hard for the general public to understand that but we think they're really there. Fairness, you know, everybody would have fairness on the list in a set of criteria for economic efficiency. In the context of international business tax, that's really pretty hard to figure out, however. Uh, are we thinking about fairness between individuals, fairness between companies, <coughs> fairness between countries? All of those things kind of might push us in different directions. Um, robustness to avoidance, that's pretty straightforward. I think everybody in this room would know that's where we're coming from in a sense, that's where the whole BETS project came from. Ease of administration, lack of complexity, that's pretty straightforward as well. Uh, and incentive compatibility is the one that you, know, may, you may not recognize there. What we have in mind there is there's an incentive to actually be part of the solution and be part of the group rather than to deviate from it. Uh, and I'll say more about that in the context of pillar two. But an example of this is just tax competition in the existing system. So, you know, the UK has been pretty competitive. It's reduced its tax rate over time in order to attract new business. You know, it's attracting that new business from somewhere else that creates negative effects on other countries. Uh, the US has now had to reduce its tax rates, you know, either to compete with that or to just kind of not look so high. So that's a kind of process by which, you know, countries are effectively undermining each other. We're imposing negative costs on each other by, through that competition. If we have a tax system which is not like that, then you know, that's so much the better. 
So can we think of any tax systems like that? Well, I can think of many, but you know, one, for example, would be VAT. Although we actually have rules in the EU about you know, what VAT rates we're allowed to have, uh, actually, we don't really care what uh, VAT rate France has. If France reduces its corporation tax rate to zero, you know, the UK would be quite concerned about that. If France reduces its VAT rate to zero, then so what? Um, by and large, unless you really want to go to France and buy everything that you want to buy. Um, so that's, those are my principles in a sense. You know, it's not very simple to say what they are, but you know, these are the things by which we might want to evaluate tax systems. Okay, so when we think about this, let's, this is a kind of very, very, very high level view of you know, what's going on here. So, and some of you may have seen this before, probably presented this before. And if we ask the question, you know, where can we tax multinational companies? Uh, it seems to me there's four different types of places. And there are these four columns. So we could think about uh, taxing the shareholders. So ultimately, you know, the profit that the multinational makes belongs to the shareholders. We actually, by and large, tax the capital income and the dividends and interest received of individuals on a worldwide basis. We already do that. You know, that's kind of broadly, if, if we could just take all those multinational profits and allocate it to individual shareholders, that would probably solve the problem. You know, it's maybe pretty difficult to do. Next is parent residence, where the headquarters is. Um, then we have what I call origin, what some people may call source, but I try and avoid the use, the use of the word source because it means so many different things to different people. So this is basically where all the functions and activities of the business take place, you know, where ownership of intangibles and ownership of other assets takes place. That's all kind of grouped into origin. Um, and a destination, uh, I think two things, where we make sales to final consumers and possibly in the digital context where the users are. Um, so we have shareholders, parent company, you know, affiliates broadly, customers and users. Um, so I think you know, I, there are one or two of our students from the MSC tax who may have seen this before, and I think I'd probably ask them at this point, you know, if you were designing a system to be the most complicated you could possibly uh, think of, uh, and the most complex, and you had to choose one of these columns, uh, which would you choose? Now, I know this is a pretty sophisticated group here, so there are probably reasons for choosing any one of these four. But you know, my starting point would be the origin. Uh, we're trying to take the profits of this multinational company and allocate it between all the different things that the multinational company is doing. You know, Apple has got the R&D in California, it makes it in China. A lot of sales apparently arrive in Ireland. Um, you know, so trying to figure out where value is created in the way that we do at the moment is extraordinarily complicated. Um, so where should we go from here? It's pretty clear that actually, you know, where the proposals on the table are going here is kind of both direct and simultaneously. Let's move back to where the headquarters is. Well, it's not entirely clear to me what pillar two is saying, but I'm gonna assume for the moment, it really means that we're gonna, the, the income inclusion part of it is to, gonna be at headquarter level. Uh, it may not be, I guess. Um, that would take us to parent residence. Uh, or we can move the other direction to the market country. So now we're saying, okay, well, you know, if we take this, the first uh, bullet point in Janine's last slide, which is, can you explain this to the general public? I think we're going to have a hard time. We're going to, we're mostly based in the origin, and that's clearly going to stay there. But we might move some bits of it in either direction. I think that's the question I think I'd like to pose is, you know, are either of those two directions useful? Uh, and, you know, in terms of meeting the criteria that I just set out. Um, so if we think about the existing system, um, you know, does it do well on those five criteria? I'd say actually not very well. Uh, and I don't think this is just a problem with digital companies, as Mike said. I think I, I certainly take the point that if, if this system doesn't solve the, thing, the problems with digital companies, then it's failed. It needs to do that. But I think it needs to do beyond that. You know, and I think actually the example of Apple is quite instructive. I mean, it's, I, you know, a lot of people have spent a lot of time thinking that the way that we tax Apple is not that good. You know, and we have state aid provisions, you know, a lot of uh, profit arises in Ireland. Um, I think, you know, that's reflected in some of the problems that we have at the moment. And if we're thinking that's not a digital problem, then I think that's evidence for the fact that actually the problems are wider than that. So are we robust to avoidance? Well, that's what the whole BETS project was about, you know, it, Clearly, we don't think we've completely solved that. Things have got more complex. We certainly still have an incentive compatibility problem as countries uh, compete with each other. We certainly still have economic efficiency problems. 
fairness, I kind of sit on the fence. I'm not really sure, you know, how to think about fairness because there's so many di different dimensions, um, especially when we're thinking about profit. If we think about the, you know, who actually bears that, the tax on that profit, then we have to look through that. To, is it shareholders? Is it customers? Is it the employees? Those are very difficult questions. So I'll leave that one to one side. Um, so let's just a little bit more on pillar one and pillar two before I sit down. So I think a, a first question is, when we're thinking about moving to the market country, are we thinking that because it's a move to where the market is per se, what I think of as the destination, just it's a sale there? Or are we thinking of actually part of an origin system, that's where value is created? And um, we could think about the, the concept of, for example, marketing intangibles is, is really saying, I think that, okay, well, we can think of marketing intangibles as being located in the market country. And you know they create some value, then we should tax those. But we're really thinking of that as a kind of origin country in a sense that you know there's an asset here which is kind of creating some value, and we want to tax it because the asset is there. That's a really very different kind of starting point than saying we're going to tax you know this income as it arises in this market jurisdiction simply because it's a market jurisdiction. Um, so I certainly want to make that distinction. I think if we do want to really get, get into figuring out what the return from marketing intangibles is, then you know, we're going to be here for many uh, years to come. Um, we could certainly think about high demand as a source of value. You know, I'd, when people think about value creation, they're really thinking about the supply side rather than the demand side. But how valuable you know, the supply side is depends on how much people are willing to pay for it. And that's a market country kind of issue. Um, so well, I could, I actually think moving towards a destination country is a great idea, um, and but I think for a different reason. And that's because it's going to address these five criteria better. And the central reason why it does so is because consumers are immobile. Um, so what does that mean? It actually means quite a lot of things with respect to those five criteria. If if we if we had a purely destination based tax, you know, it wouldn't matter where you located your production, it wouldn't matter where you located your head office, finance facilities, or anything else, because the tax would all be in the destination country. So we're going to take away a lot of economic inefficiencies. It would be much less, but much more robust to avoidance, um, because you know we can see where the income is arising. It's much more difficult to say that income has arisen somewhere else. Um, it's going to be more incentive compatible, actually, for the same reason that VA, there's no competition over VAT rates because that's in a destination country. So this kind of this notion of immobility kind of just helps with these five criteria, I think. Um, having said that, there are lots of different ways we could think of kind of implementing a complete move to a destination country or a partial move as is envisaged <laughs> under pillar one. Um, and I don't really have time to get into all of those now. We're going to have two sessions on that in, in due course. Um, I would say one thing which kind of brings me back to, you know, what's going on in the OECD is, you know, gainers and losers. Um, you know, on the face of it, if we move a little bit away from taxing, you know, very roughly where production takes place or where functional activities is taking place to where the market is, then in terms of kind of tax base, uh, countries which have net imports are going to do better than countries with net exports. So the UK would do well, the, U the US would do well. Germany would do less well. You know, this makes it a difficult conversation uh, in OECD meetings, presumably, when you have uh, countries at different uh, positions. But I think we should also take into account that actually the revenue that we're raising now is still subject to all the problems that we have at the moment, including tax competition. And you, know, you only have to look at the graph of what's happened to tax rates, corporation tax rates over the last 20 or 30 years. They've been on a gently declining trend uh, on average. I can't really. I still can't see any reason why that uh, gently declining trend is not is going to end. Um, so, what about pillar two? So, um, the idea here seems to be you know, actually there's all this taxable income which is you know being located in low tax jurisdictions and isn't paying very much tax. So, there's almost in a sense less than single taxation. So, is this a prevention of low or low taxation? And here, kind of. Somewhat cheekily, I have a quote from an early Bex report uh, which says that no or low taxation is not per se a cause of concern, but it becomes so when it is associated with practices that artificially segregate taxable income from the activities that generate it. I can't see that element really being there very strongly in pillar two. Um, you know, I think it's 
the OCD and the members of the OCD may have changed their mind and have moved on. That's fine. I think it's perfectly acceptable to change one's mind in the face of new evidence. I've done that many times. Um, I think, you know, particular issue here is competition. I think the advocates of this would suggest that actually everybody could get to, together. They can agree a minimum tax rate everywhere. That's going to halt tax competition in a way that the BETS process was not really designed to do at all. Um, but I would take a step back and say, you know, is this really a suitable place to tax? And I take these four columns literally. I'm going to say, you know, the shareholders are in one country. All the activities are in a different country. Consumers are in a different country. What is there left in the parent company? Well, there might be a few bit of management. That's about it. Um, why is that the place where we would want to tax worldwide income of this multinational? I just can't really see a very good rational, rationale for it. And I don't think it does very well on our, on our five criteria. Um, you know, those parents are in principle mobile. There's no particular reason why they need to be there. Um, subject to anti-inversion rules, which the US knows a lot about. Um, so I think the final point is, you know, are the advocates of this who think that actually countries could come together you know, agree some kind of approach on a pillar two basis for the income inclusion part in particular, which will effectively lead to some kind of minimum worldwide tax. Um, and I think the question then is, well, are they likely to do that? Is this incentive compatible? Um, and there, I, you know, the question I pose to myself and pose to anybody else in the room is, you know, suppose Germany and France announce that this is a good idea and they plan to do it. So what is the best response of other countries like the UK? And one response would be to say, okay, it's not a bad idea. We could join in with this. That would indeed help kind of slow the process of tax competition and maybe set a minimum bar. Um, another possible response is to kind of send a note to German and French multinational companies and say, hey, you know what? We're not going to do this. Um, you know, come to the UK. Um, that's the process of tax competition. That's what we've done on the tax rate, I don't really see why we wouldn't do it here as well. Um, so I'm not sure that pillar two is incentive compatible. Um, I think it is, the pillar one is much more incentive compatible, at least kind of moving to more taxation in the place of the consumer. Um, let me stop there and have some discussion.